Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast, New Books in Economic and Business History. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today we have a very special episode. I'm very happy because we have today with us Josh Over. Josh is professor of political science and classics at Stanford, where he also has a courtesy appointment in philosophy. Josh is also the founder and head of the Stanford Civics Initiative. Uh, we're going to be talking about that in a bit. And Josh is one of my mentors, and that's probably what makes this episode like particularly special. He's someone I admire profoundly, and I learn a lot from him each time I have even the briefest of the conversation. So I'm sure that all of you are going to learn a lot um, during this conversation as well. We have Josh today because, um, well, he's an expert on ancient Greece. He's going to tell us more about his career in a bit. But he published recently this book called The Greek, The Greeks and the Rational, The Discovery of Practical Reason. Um, it's edited by the University of California Press, and it's a fascinating book. We're going to talk also about that book in a bit. But I think that probably every economist is going to be interested in this book, and he's going to tell us a bit um, about that today. So, Josh, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you so much, Javier. It's delightful to be able to have this conversation. And I'll just say right right off the bat, I've learned an awful lot from you as well. I mean, uh, uh, just because I have gray hair um, doesn't mean I stop learning. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Josh. It's actually interesting that we're having this conversation remotely today. Our offices are next to each other at Stanford. So we interact like on a daily basis, but now we're recording this remotely. And and maybe I would like to start by asking you about your career. So you're one of the biggest experts in ancient uh, Greece, but how did that happen? So you're someone that grew up in Minnesota. When did you end up being interested in ancient Greece? How did you manage to learn ancient Greek? Like, tell us about how you build your career, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it was, uh, in some ways, quite accidental. Uh, I wasn't a very good student when I was in high school. I went to the local university, University of Minnesota, almost accidentally. Um, I'd sort of considered not even bothering uh, with uh, higher education. It was the uh, early 1970s. Um, at that time, I had a lot of other things I was interested in um, that didn't have much to do with higher education. Um, uh, so uh, I did uh, started taking classes. And one of the very first classes I took was in Greek history. More or less, that was an accident. Um, it was a course that was available. Um, it fit my schedule. I had, as a kid, always enjoyed Greek mythology, and I sort of remembered that. And so I thought, well, why not try it? And I totally fell in love with it. Uh, the professor was very old school, very, you know, uh, in many ways, kind of rigid and demanding, um, uh, but he cared so passionately about his field. Um, and he convinced me that, yeah, I should care passionately about it too. So at the um, end of this course, um, you know, introductory course, 12 weeks later, I went to his office and said, well, I've decided I want to be you. I want to, I want to be a, a historian of ancient Greece. And he kind of looked me up and down and said, no, it's not going to work. <laughs> and I you could see why he thought that. I mean, I didn't look like, I didn't sort of come off as the kind of person who was likely to go on and have a career um, as a Greek historian. But I then uh, said, well, well, just in case um, I was going to try to do this, what, what would I have to do? And he says, well, you have to learn Greek. Um, and so I began learning Greek and then Latin and um, uh, of course, then continuing to study history. Um, and one thing led to another, um, that eventually I found myself um, uh, with a PhD um, uh, in Greek history. Um, and uh, 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 that was that. How did you manage to make people in political science um, interested in what you're doing? So you have this very interesting profile in which um, people from many different disciplines pay attention to what you do, right? And I guess that your natural 
uh, ecosystem was uh, the people in classics departments and history departments. Um, at what point do political scientists and even economists now realize that uh, you you had something interesting to say or like were you looking for that uh, explicitly? Was that like an uh, un unexpected outcome? What was that process like? <laughs> It was, in some ways, once again, somewhat accidental. Um, my first job uh, after I got my PhD was at Montana State University, uh, which was um, uh, a, in some ways, um, uh, not a big liberal arts center. Um, uh, it had no other person studying the ancient world, no classics department. Um, so I was pretty much on my own. Um, and I could read what I wanted and uh, talk to uh, whoever I wanted. Um, I was lucky enough to get a uh, post uh, postdoctoral appointment uh, at a research center that had some very distinguished uh, uh, sociologists um, uh, and economists uh, uh, attached to it. They suggested that I read some things that I probably wouldn't have read otherwise. Uh, and I suddenly uh, I found myself doing a kind of Greek history that was quite different from the ordinary work that was being done by most other Greek historians. I probably couldn't have gotten away with this if I was actually at a conventional classics department or in a history department that had other ancient historians. But because I was off in Montana doing um, uh, whatever I pleased, really, uh, uh, I was able to develop a project that was really quite uh, uh, different from a lot of the work that was uh, being done. And when the book was published, this was a, a book called Mass and Elite in Democratic Athens, I found that a lot of people beyond the world of Greek history thought it was interesting um, because that was using some social science methods that were uh, still pretty unusual um, for ancient historians at that time. Mm, um, so now I'm, I mean, I'm curious about your perspective on this type of research now, considering that now you're in a more conventional place and that will probably stand for is not conventional at any level, but part of, uh, I guess, the core of the uh, academic um, world how much space do you see for people trying to do this type of interdisciplinary research do you think that are we getting more close to those ideas are there more spaces and we're just complaining a lot about that what's your take and also like i so you advise like many many students like how Do you talk about this with your students? Yeah, I do. And uh, when I first uh, began to direct graduate students, I moved from Montana State to Princeton University um, on the strength of this book that people got interested in. And I told my students at that point when I started um, directing graduate students that it was really a risk for them, uh, that the kind of work I was doing was not mainstream. Um, I was now in a classics department and the students there had very good language background, but I said the kind of work that you're going to do if you study with me is probably not the kind of work that you know every other Greek historian is going to be doing or every other person studying Greek literature is going to be doing. Uh, and so I you know, tried to be as honest as I could and happily it worked pretty well. It, They ended up doing really new kind of scholarship um, uh, projects that were at least were um, legible to me, um, but were beyond anything I was going to do. Um, the, you know, they had certain skills, they had certain ideas. Um, uh, so uh, it turned out that the field was willing to accept this um, a body of new work. So this really began in the 1990s um, and has continued on since. So I think there is space for it. Um, the difficulty is, is that it's really necessary if you're going to do this kind of interdisciplinary work to really know, as it were, both sides of the equation. You've got to really know your history well for a 
classical scholar, you've got to know classical literature, you've got to know the right languages, um, as well as really knowing the social science work well enough anyway to be able to use it without being embarrassing, um, to use it in a way um, that a social scientist, a political scientist, an economist um, can read it and say, yes, this makes sense. You're not making silly mistakes. You're not importing um, concepts that are simply um, foreign uh, to the uh, to the social science milieu. So it's really, it's, it's, it's very demanding, um, uh, but I think it does create space for genuinely new work. So instead of just doing the same thing, maybe a little better, maybe a little worse than the previous generation of scholars do, uh, we can actually do work that wasn't imagined by the previous generations of scholars uh, and began to really expand out both our understanding of the past, but also we can test theories, we can test hypotheses that are generated from social science by a whole new body of evidence, um, by a world that is not modernity, um, uh, but is well enough documented to allow us to do some real testing. Let, let me use that um, last element that you bring to the conversation to start talking about your book or just like first starting to bring the ancient world to our conversation. And I've always had this um, um, question in my head, which is uh, why everything at some point seems to date back to ancient Greece, right? There's... And, and I guess, and I've always wanted to ask you this, actually, which is what was the, the special thing that this period, this society had that somehow we are able to learn so many things still nowadays? And I guess that like a simple answer is that you can always learn from other people and other societies. And maybe there's nothing particularly special about uh, ancient Greece. Um, or maybe is it a marketing story in which they were they just took like a great set of things of other peoples and they just synthesized that pretty well, or maybe they were like truly innovative or I don't know maybe I, I guess I'm speculating too much. What what would be your 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 answer to to that type of question? What what was special about ancient uh, ancient Greece? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question, um, and it's one I've spent a lot of time trying to think about um, over the course of my career. I think that one thing we have to say is that the Greeks weren't in some profound way, you know, magical. Um, there was no miracle. There, uh, it's sort of common back when I was a student to talk about the Greek miracle. And I don't think there's anything miraculous about what happened um, in Greece, um, but I think it is distinctive. Uh, there we have in the Greek world um, a body of literature, a whole set of cultural developments that are, I think, unusual. Uh, so the reason that we study the Greek world as intensively as we do, the reason that so many people remain interested in it is in part because the cultural products of that world really were distinctive, not just like everything else in, in, in the world, um, and remain attractive to us in some ways, or at least to many people. They're attractive because I think we can recognize them as both familiar enough, they're like enough, like us, enough, but they're also, of course, different. You know, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's another world. So it's another world that we can uh, recognize, um, doesn't seem desperately foreign, and yet it's foreign enough to be fascinating. All right, why? I think the core argument is that the Greek world developed in a way that was in some ways quite unusual in world history, and that is it was a highly um, uh, decentralized, extensive ecology of independent states. So beginning in about the time of Homer, um, say around 750 BCE, and continuing down to past, well past the time of Aristotle in the fourth century BCE, the Greek world was divided into something in the range of a thousand different 
independent states. Well, very small by modern standards, Athens was gigantic with a maximum population of perhaps a half a million and a territory um, of about um, uh, a thousand square miles. Uh, um, uh, so um, uh, it was a it was a it was a however a very extensive uh, ecology of independent states, probably by the time of Aristotle, somewhere around 8 million Greek speakers divided into these many, many um, independent states. Each of these states was um, in some ways in competition with other states, and yet also had developed ways of cooperating with other states. So we've got war. On the other hand, we've got a lot of trade, a lot of exchange of uh, both ideas and practices. So the competition and cooperation um, is across this world of independent states. Instead of having a world, say, um, classical China, Han era China, in which there's a big centralized state that's pretty much organizing things at the top. I think the competition and cooperation, new forms of um, cooperation, generate uh, a lot of um, demand for innovation. Um, there are a lot of potential for innovation, lots of experimenting going on. Not all of these states did things the same way. They had different forms of government, different forms of institutions. And those institutions could be borrowed when they work well in one state or one set of states across other states. Uh, and the um, uh, same way with um, uh, cultural uh, products. So Athens turns out to be very good at making um, the beautiful pots. They spread across the uh, uh, Greek world, uh, uh, different forms of uh, uh, expression, um, tragedy, uh, philosophy, um, uh, history, um, uh, once again, um, can be developed in one place and then adapted um, and spread around. So once, no one's telling everybody in this world what to do. Um, uh, there's no sort of standard way in which uh, uh, a state needs to be uh, organized. And it just generates um, uh, a lot of useful friction um, uh, that creates the possibility ultimately um, for all kinds of productive exchange. Um, and ultimately, uh, this drives uh, a lot of um, uh, economic growth uh, over time, uh, and uh, that sustains then um, uh, the possibility for um, a lot of um, you know, people have enough leisure to engage in um, the new forms of uh, cultural enterprise, and the result of that really is the sort of Greek civilization that is uh, attractive to us today. So in, in, in this book, you... And this book, I mean, The Greeks and the Rational, you focus on, I guess, one of those innovations, which is the emergence of what you call the practical reason, right? Mm -hmm. In order to get, so I would like to hear about your thesis in the book and so on, but I think that a good way of getting there, and actually that's how you build the narrative in the book itself is, um, to talk a bit about the title itself, right? So it's the Greeks and the rational, right? And that responds to something. Do you want to tell us about that story? Yeah, indeed. Uh, so when I was a uh, graduate student, uh, I was told by my PhD advisor that uh, one of the greatest books that had been written in the 20th century uh, was by uh, E.R. Dodds, um, and it was a book called The Greeks and the Irrational. And Dodds wrote this wonderful book based on his um, Sather classical lectures that he gave in 1949. The book came out two years later. Wonderful book about all of the ways in which the Greeks were really strange. Um, uh, the way in which they were not simply thinking about you know, high philosophical um, uh, abstractions, but rather that they were thinking about magic um, uh, and religion uh, and even shamanism, uh, putting curses on one another, um, uh, imagining um, uh, all kinds of potentials uh, uh, for a spiritual 
existence. Um, so what uh, Daz wanted to push away from was the idea that the Greeks were just these uh, people who had produced Plato and Aristotle, the whole body of, um, as it were, um, uh, uh, rational work. Um, so it was a wonderful book. Um, really, really changed the way we think about things. Um, uh, I was then invited to give the same lecture series that Dodds had given in 1949, exactly 70 years after. So in 2019, and I thought, well, what's left of the rational um, after the Dodds revolution? Because it really was a revolution. And uh, I then thought um, uh, it would be interesting to try to talk about not scientific rationality, because there's been a lot of work um, on that, and only sort of secondarily the kind of philosophical rationality that had been um, the target of Dodd's work, but rather instrumental or strategic rationality, the kind of rationality that economists uh, tend to think about. But the question was, um, did the Greeks have a conception of rationality, of, um, uh, of the way that people behaved um, as rational beings that in any way was consistent with the way that contemporary economists concerned with for example, expected utility maximization, think about um, uh, the human motivation, the micro foundations of social order. And you know, the book argues, I argued in the book, yes, um, uh, the Greeks, in fact, uh, had thought through a lot of the background assumptions that had developed, indeed, an entire theory of human motivation that was, in many ways, um, really quite similar to the kind of background assumptions that economists make, um, the kind of um, rational actor theory that underpins um, a great deal of economic thought today. That, so I think, and I remember when you first told me about um, the fact that you were working on this book and that the premise was um, that you could identify game theory in, in ancient Greece. I remember thinking, that's quite revolutionary. I've never heard that as an economist. And I'm fairly well trained in the history of economic thought and and... And I thought, wow, that's that's amazing. I'm still like, after reading the book, like quite uh, surprised by the fact that it has made me question a lot the way in which the history of economic thought is done and why do we pay attention to certain things and not to others and so on. So I'm not surprised that economists had missed that this thing had happened just because we're looking at our at ourselves and we're obsessed with modernity and with the 18th and 19th century ideas and so on. But I'm a bit surprised that um, I guess experts in the ancient world had not figured this out before. And I guess my question to you is, what was that the case? And I guess that some of my interest is to understand why I guess you guys were focused on this irrational or ritualistic dimension of society for so long. Like what were the forces that kept that active? Um, but also what was the thing that allowed you to perceive this and see what were you seeing that other people were not? And I, I don't know, how, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, no, great. Uh, so I think there are various reasons that um, the discovery of practical reason that I claim in this book uh, escaped the attention um, of uh, ancient historians, classical philosophers, classicists um, for, for so long. So one reason I think is because especially in the 20th century, um, uh, there was a increasingly sort of firm Com commitment to the idea that the Greek world was radically different from modernity, yeah, that the idea that the Greeks were like us, which had been at least a fairly common conception in the um, 18th and up into the 19th century, was just rejected, uh, that the Greeks were thought to be 
desperately foreign was one of the ways people talked about it, or the past was a foreign country, um, a foreign a country that perhaps we could visit, perhaps we could learn uh, uh, some of its ways, but um, it was always going to be utterly foreign to us. Um, uh, and I think there were reasons for that. Um, uh, partly it was correcting the sort of over-enthusiastic attempts to sort of make the Greeks modern, of some 19th century thinkers. Uh, but I think part of it was because the um, uh, contemporary 20th century thinkers wanted another place. They wanted a past that was other than our own. And this is, um, uh, for example, quite uh, uh, prominent in the work of probably the greatest Greek historian of the 20th century, Moses Finlay, or M.I. Finlay, uh, ultimately Sir Moses Finlay, uh, knighted for his contributions to uh, ancient history. Uh, Finlay um, began uh, his career as a Marxist. He became sort of a, more of a Weberian as he went along. That was very impressed with the work of um, Karl Polanyi. Um, Polanyi, really very interesting uh, mid-20th century economist, was deeply concerned to find some way that was a non-capitalist, but not a fully Marxist form of economic activity, and he located it in, in the past. Um, he wanted to say that there were alternatives to the way we do things today. Um, and it had to then be that the past, people in the past just did things completely differently. They thought about things completely differently. They didn't have the same kind of motivations um, as we have today. And it was then possible to use the past as an alternative to everything that people in the 20th century didn't much like about modernity. I think that's at least one reason. Another reason uh, is that the Greek philosophers, and really a lot of the book goes into analysis of philosophical texts. So the Greek philosophers were really concerned with two forms of reasoning. The instrumental reasoning that I emphasize in the book but they thought of that as really only the foundation or the platform for a higher and a more important form of rationality or reasoning. And we can call that ethical reasoning. That is reasoning not just that aims at getting what you want, but rather reasoning that aims at wanting the right thing, the thing that is truly best. So that instead of sticking with the idea of a kind of subjective rationality, um, that is, you know, I want something, I have no particular reason to want it, I just happen to want it, how do I go about best getting it or getting as much of it as I possibly can? And that's basically economic or instrumental rationality. But the uh, philosophers thought that what you really ought to be doing is going for the thing that was actually best for you. Um, and they thought that they could identify what was actually best for anybody. Um, so the thing that would actually allow you to live a truly flourishing or a truly excellent or a truly fine and worthwhile life. So they were considered concerned then with a kind of an interpersonal measurement of um, uh, your going for something um, could be measured against someone else going for something, and they could measure which one of you went for the better thing, uh, which one of you was doing the more rational thing because you're going for the right thing, as opposed to the kind of intrapersonal measurement or uh, ranking that economists are concerned with, getting clear about what you want more than something else so that you're rational in terms of what you're actually going for. So uh, I think that also tended to um, make the instrumental reasoning that sits behind all of this as a foundation just made it invisible. Rationality became 
going for the right thing, not going for the thing you happen to want. Um, uh, and the Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, before them Socrates, were really worried that if people did just go for whatever they wanted and maximized and got good at maximizing whatever they happened to want, they'd actually make a mess of their lives. Um, they really were quite hostile to sticking at that subjective rationality level. They thought that was really quite, you know, as it were, morally dangerous. Dangerous to you as an individual, dangerous to society. And so because of this emphasis on ethical rationality, the instrumental rationality that was the platform for whole, the whole philosophical, whole moral sort of enterprise just became invisible. It was like the foundations were, were deep um, and everyone, uh, as it were, focused on the beautiful mansion that was built up um, rather than looking at the foundations that made the it possible for the mansion to, 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 to actually stand. So I sort of dig, dug down and said, well, what are the foundations? What are they, what are they basing um, their conception of ethical rationality on? And um, uh, I argued then that it is um, a conception of um, uh, instrumental or strategic rationality, practical reason. Let me ask you now something that has probably a mythological uh, motivation, but um, now that you mentioned how a good part of what you do is to read these classical authors and interpret them, um, I, I would like to hear you describe how this actually works. What are the sources that you actually use? And again, think about our audience as very not particularly smart economists as most economists are indeed <laughs> and we don't do much more than work with uh, data in a computer or with models and usually that requires a pen and a notebook so this whole idea of thinking about ancient documents where do you get those documents what's the translation i guess you use compilations that have emerged over the centuries of different pieces and so on but also how that, like you read these documents and you interpret them and then your interaction with other scholars is about, well, in this given page, Plato says something and I think that you're interpreting it wrong. How does even the conversation happens among the community? That, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so uh, we have a very large body of um, literary texts have come down to us from the Greek antiquity. Yeah. And it's uh, really because these texts were pretty much continuously thought to be interesting and worthwhile, but therefore they were recopied um, and survived by being recopied time and time again, all the way down from the time of um, Homer, um, say, to our own age. We've lost a huge amount. Um, we probably have maybe five or 10 percent of the texts that were written, the serious literary texts that were written in antiquity. But we have um, uh, still uh, a lot, um, uh, hundreds of, uh, of texts, um, uh, and uh, the process by which they survived was a kind of winnowing out. The ones that got read a lot, the ones that were considered to be at various generation after generation the best, were the ones that were copied over again and again. So among these um, are a body of work by philosophers like Plato, who wrote dialogues, um, uh, a whole good large number of dialogues, dialogues between his teacher Socrates and various other intellectuals um, that uh, Socrates might have known. Uh, we have no idea really how accurate these are as records of actual conversations, um, uh, but um, it certainly captures a lot of what Plato thought was Socrates' thought and then his own 
development of that of that thought. Um, uh, and these dialogues often deal with um, uh, questions of um, uh, human agency. Uh, why do people do things? Um, uh, do they do the right thing, um, the best thing for themselves? Do they do? Um, do they create the best kind of communities or the worst kind of communities or something in between? So they deal with politics, um, with ethics, uh, with morality, um, as well as with epistemological and metaphysical questions. And the same thing with uh, the works of Aristotle. We have dozens of Aristotle's philosophical essays, um, uh, each one of which um, addressed some particular area of what Aristotle thought was um, uh, important um, aspect of human existence, um, or for that matter, natural existence. Um, he wrote lots of things about um, biology and astronomy, as well as writing about politics um, uh, and ethics. And then we have um, histor histories by um, uh, really historians like Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, who wrote um, histories either of earlier periods of, of their own time. Uh, there were um, a whole range of other kinds of uh, writing, um, drama, comedy, tragedy, um, uh, lyric poetry, um, and so on and so forth. It was a world in which there were a lot of intellectuals talking with one another, sharing ideas, um, borrowing ideas, um, trying to, well, competing for audiences. Um, and this you know, large body of, um, of literature, once again, some of which has now come down to us um, uh, and that uh, therefore we can read in, in, in Greek and now it's been translated into, into a whole range of um, contemporary you know, modern languages. So this is really a big part of what classicists study. Um, uh, and the idea is um, to try to understand what was what were each of these thinkers really trying to get across? What are the ideas that they were struggling with? Um, who were the, what were the key questions that they were worried about? Um, uh, and how did then the answers to those questions develop over time? Um, and because we have earlier literature and later literature from the Greek world, we can um, uh, work on that as well. So this is a, uh, then uh, people who study this um, uh, and you know, debate uh, what was really going on here. What was, what does Plato really mean us to take up from a story about, for example, um, a guy in Anatolia who found a magic ring, um, and then could, you know, made him invisible um, uh, so that he could do whatever he liked. Um, but why would Plato, a moral philosopher, tell a story about a guy um, who has a magic ring? Well, my argument is, is that he wanted to explain what are baseline human motivations when all social constraint is eliminated. Now, in the story, the guy who finds the magic ring can do what he likes because no one can see him. Uh, he can accomplish anything that he chooses, and the story suggests that he'll simply break every rule that his society had in order to get um, the most of what he wants, which turns out to be basically wealth and sex and power. Um, so, uh, uh, so my argument then is that Plato tells us this story because he's really trying to isolate at least one set of claims that were being made by intellectuals in his time about human motivation human motivation, which is then stripped of all of the ordinary social constraints um, that uh, will get in the way of doing just whatever you want. And starting then with this baseline idea of the, you know, the, the human actor who will simply you know, maximize on um, his most primitive desires, um, Plato then has to say, well, how would we um, create a good society um, in the face of that kind of um, baseline motivation. Okay, we're back. There was uh, 
brief interruption that we had for technical reasons, but um, I, I want to get back to where we left the conversation. And and I, I, what I was trying to do was trying to articulate a question that was in the back of my head while I was reading the book, which was the sort of practical motivations behind the, um, the emergence of these ideas, right? So during the 20th century, when we think about the um, emergence and expansion of game theory, the Cold War setting was particularly important and the strategic behavior was crucial for practical reasons, for ge geopolitical reasons. And you could tell that that was behind the papers that were being written, although they were not exactly framed as applied papers that were designed to help the U.S. deal with a potential uh, nuclear attack or something like that. But it was clear that those motivations were there. Um, and I'm wondering if that's the case also in the setting that you're exploring, right? Um, are there some practitioners that were motivating this? Were they writing a lot? at all were these thinkers like Plato or Aristotle having that in mind were they trying to aim for the favor of a prince or a king or something how how do you do that how can you recognize that in the in the text yeah so the argument that i make uh, in the book is that as early as the time of Homer, um, say 8th century BCE, we can see people, the characters in these literary works, acting in ways that we can attribute to them some kind of strategic rationality. But the theory of strategic rationality, the ability to think about this abstractly as a basically a theory of human motivation and behavior, um, one that actually could be refined, um, it could be taught uh, so that it could be kind of a kind of expertise. One could become an expert in strategic behavior. So like a game theorist can become an expert in doing game theory, you can work, you know, work your way back on the um, game tree more efficiently than someone who is unfamiliar with, with game theory. But I think all of that, um, that big, the, the, the discovery of practical reason, this is what I'm really the book's about, is um, uh, comes about in a particular time in a particular place. It comes about in Athens, um, uh, the biggest of the Greek city-states, um, and in the middle of the fifth century, when Athens was the most influential and the most powerful of the Greek city-states. Athens at this time had become an imperial center, uh, had used the power that was generated out of the development of basically a democratic form of government, um, which allowed much more efficient use of a much larger um, uh, manpower base than previous forms of social organization in Greece. And so Athens was a real center um, for intellectual activity. It was where you wanted to be. Um, it was Paris in the 19th century. Um, uh, it was uh, you know, Rome in the first century AD. Um, so uh, the intellectuals from around the Greek world tended to congregate um, in Athens, and they were highly competitive with one another. Um, they were basically trying to attract students. They were trying to attract attention. They were trying to, we would now say, build their brand. Yeah. A lot of these um, uh, intellectuals uh, were called by them later, Plato and Aristotle, who come in the next century, um, call them the sophists, um, the people who uh, uh, were purported to be able to teach wisdom, uh, Sophia um, in Greek. So, uh, uh, so what would the sophists care about? Um, uh, well, they claim to be able to teach you, um, as a prospective student, how to organize your own 
affairs, um, basically how to organize your household, how to organize the um, apparatus of your life, um, uh, become wealthy, um, and then how to be influential in your city, um, in your city-state, um, how to um, be a, uh, a politician. Um, and they thought these two things really went together pretty well. This is also a time of great power um, competition. So we've got these intellectuals competing with each other for um, uh, students, for um, coming up with uh, explanations about human behavior. We also have states um, uh, that are uh, competing with each other at a higher level than um, uh, was previously possible. Um, Athens and uh, its rival state, Sparta, have become really powerful in that they're each controlling large blocks of other states, alliance systems, and uh, intellectuals are becoming increasingly worried about what's going to happen here. So, for example, Thucydides writes his great history of the war between Athens and Sparta um, as uh, an analysis of uh, state power. Uh, and the motivation of states um, when they're engaged in very high stakes competitions over influence, resources, um, uh, other states. Uh, so I think that in many ways, it is the 20th century kind of period. A lot of the game theory, of course, developed in the United States, which was at that point a um, emerging great world power um, engaged in a very high stakes competition with another great world power at that point, the Soviet Union, and a lot of concern about what's going to happen. Um, uh, is it possible to avoid the, the most catastrophic outcomes? Um, uh, and so, uh, yes, I think there were in many ways, the situation was in some ways similar. Um, there were reasons for um, people to come, for example, from uh, Hungary, um, where number of you know, major intellectuals working on game theory you know, end up coming, um, coming from Hungary, end up in the United States because of the world situation um, uh, at that point. And they end up working on um, problems of uh, uh, the uh, competition between um, uh, these two great nuclear powers, the uh, uh, U.S. And the, and the USSR, um, in the same sort of way that um, intellectuals tended to gravitate towards Athens um, uh, and concern themselves with um, the great state competition between between Athens and Sparta. Let me ask you one one final question about the book, um, which is because because so your thesis is not just that, or what you want to say is not just that uh, the Greek had discovered uh, practical reason, but you also want to claim that there are things that we can learn from their approach to to this idea right that um there are lessons that our modern world can extract from this what are those those lessons you already anticipated a bit like this ethical approach that uh greek philosophers had but uh, i would like to hear what's the message that you want to transmit there yeah, I think the core thing that I'd like to bring out um, is that practical reason understood as strategic rationality, understood as expected utility maximization, whether by an individual or whether by a community or by a state, is a really important part of how we need to be thinking about um, uh, how the world works, how people are motivated, how they act, how states are motivated and how they act. It's also incomplete. Um, uh, it's not adequate um, as a complete explanation. Once again, the Greeks understood this uh, so that Thucydides, in writing his great history of the war between Athens and Sparta, talks about the way in which both the competitors acted and believed that they were acting rationally, um, perfectly good game theoretic kind of uh, ways, but also how other 
agents, um, some other states, refused to act rationally, acted irrationally, acted off the path um, of the game, um, and did so systematically, um, did so in ways that I think Thucydides suggests a, a rational actor ought to anticipate. So um, they give us, I think the Greeks give us both a theory of strategic reason, pure um, uh, self-interest-based uh, uh, utility maximization. They give us a theory of deviations from reason uh, or for pure strategic reason. And they also give us, um, as we were talking about earlier, um, a theory of ethical reasoning. Um, that is uh, uh, the idea that perhaps um, you ought to think about what it is that you should want, not only what it is that you do want, um, but what it is that you should want. So that maximizing simply on accumulating material goods may actually not be the best for either yourself as an individual, hoping to live a fully realized, flourishing life, nor perhaps the best for the community that you live in or the larger world of human communities. Um, so I think that putting strategic rationality, game theoretic kind of reasoning into a context um, uh, of uh, that we understand its limits, we understand the ways in which it doesn't engage with important ethical questions, um, allows us to really um, uh, use game theory, use strategic reasoning, recognize it as important without turning it into the be all and end all. I think there's a tendency, um, certainly among many humanists, um, to want to say that uh, we should reject the idea of strategic reason, um, that it's somehow wicked, uh, that it is uh, uh, a way of thinking that is malicious. Um, the, uh, and, uh, that seems to me to be foolish. Um, uh, it seems to me silly to say that um, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, we should reject the phenomenon of strategic reason because we believe it to be ethically um, limited. Uh, rather, I think um, we should uh, try to understand it, um, but also try to understand its limits um, uh, and uh, ethical alternatives. That's fantastic. I, I really love that element of the book, right? Like it um, probably brings like the crucial elements into what a social scientist should uh, be thinking of. And I think that we regularly, um, I guess, get lost in like the everyday motivations of our profession and we, we forget about those things. So I'm very happy that you, you bring that up. Um, let me... Um, use the opportunity and, and the fact that we're talking um, and now this is on record, I, I would like to ask you about the Stanford Civics Initiative. You came up with this um, fascinating idea of creating a, a project that I admire profoundly. I must say I'm a fellow at the Stanford Civics Initiative. So I'm not saying that because that's the case. I, I truly believe in, in the project. Um, and, and probably not many people know about uh, about it, what? How do you describe it, and what? What? Why are we doing what we're doing? Yeah, yeah. So the Stanford Civics Initiative emerged um, uh, almost accidentally, um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's now pretty well um, uh, established, as you as you know. The goal of the initiative um, uh, is to allow Stanford students and ultimately as a model students in other universities in the United States and elsewhere to take the kind of courses um, that we involved in this initiative believe they ought to have been offered um, uh, in any good university. That is, um, uh, courses that not only are involved with helping them to be um, uh, more effective in the economic realm, so 
good at, for example, coding um, uh, or good at um, uh, uh, various forms of um, uh, engineering um, or, or, or sort of, as it were, economic skills, but um, should also uh, be offered courses that help them uh, to become effective uh, in terms of their skills as citizens, um, and specifically as citizens of democratic societies. So we are sort of value-centered. We do think it would be better to have a democracy than not have a democracy. Um, and we think that democracy is actually quite difficult to get and to keep. Um, and it's um, uh, impossible to get and keep if citizens of a democracy um, don't have a sense of um, what it is to be a citizen. Um, and that, um, I think, is... Uh, a major part of the education, um, higher education, um, uh, that's often been forgotten um, in even great universities like Stanford. Yeah. So the goal really is to offer a range of courses, um, uh, uh, your own course, for example, um, that uh, gives uh, talks about um, the history of economic thought. Strangely, there were courses um, that uh, uh, engaged with the history of economic thought that talked about both Marx um, uh, and Adam Smith um, uh, and uh, Friedrich Hayek um, uh, and uh, John Maynard Keynes um, and put them all into a kind of context. Um, uh, or uh, uh, courses um, like mine in the origins of political thought um, that uh, engages with, well, how is it that the Greek thinkers um, uh, worried about, uh, came to worry about justice and interdependence um, uh, and uh, power and legitimacy, um, or um, you know, a whole range of courses um, that deal with uh, basically the kind of skills and thinking that citizens need to bring to the work of being an effective decision maker, leader, um, voter, um, uh, engaged uh, individual um, in, a, in a democratic community. It is much more demanding than simply being a subject uh, of a ruler, um, because in a democracy, it's us, the citizens, who have to ultimately be those who make the rules directly or through our representatives and interpret those rules and are ultimately responsible for enforcing those rules. Um, and unless we have some idea about, well, how are rules made? Where do they come from? Uh, 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 what are the um, uh, costs um, of coming up with uh, rules that um, are not incentive compatible, rules that people won't follow? Um, uh, what are the um, uh, trade-offs uh, between um, abstract ideas of ideal justice um, and available options um, uh, that can be sustained through the kind of bargains that citizens can make with one another? We lack that kind of skills. We lack that kind of capacity to think historically um, uh, as well as uh, uh, sociologically, as well as economically, um, as well as uh, uh, philosophically. If we can't put those pieces together, um, we're not going to be effective citizens of a democracy. So the Civics Initiative basically says, well, that's what we should have. We should hire really um, uh, terrific teachers um, who are absolutely dedicated to teaching and dedicated to teaching in a way that is not Polarized. It is not. Um, uh, it is not um, partisan. It's not um, telling the students that there's one correct um, uh, outcome um, when thinking about these value questions: a left outcome, or a right outcome, or a capitalist outcome, or a Marxist outcome. But rather, asks students to um, and invites them and requires them um, to debate serious questions of value, um, good and bad 
right and wrong, um, uh, positive and uh, negative outcomes, makes them think about that in the terms of costs and benefits, um, about availability um, uh, of particular options, um, uh, about the trade-offs that come uh, with compromise, uh, and uh, uh, ultimately then um, gives them the kind of background skills, understanding, knowledge um, that they can uh, use in um, going forward and being effective uh, members of a, of a democratic community. So that's, that's what it's about. Uh, once again, it's, uh, uh, you know, the shorthand is um, we uh, offer courses um, that uh, your parents uh, thought you were going to get um, when they sent you to school in the first place. You have, I'm, I'm heard you once saying that what we do in a certain way is to bring back the soul of the university that at some point maybe was lost for well for many reasons and and i feel i'm, I'm always very inspired by um your words and the purpose and objectives of the initiative so i want to thank you for that um i want yeah i want to thank you for creating like something that has like so much meaning and and gives us an idea of that we're doing something well, it's, that it's, has it's an been, impact. Yeah, it is. It's, it's been exciting. Um, and the, the fact that uh, so many um, Stanford students seem to be flocking to our courses, they want to take courses that are challenging, um, uh, that are not just about, you know, how to, you know, um, get a bigger salary when you um, uh, get out of Stanford. Uh, uh, so, you know, your courses, um, I think you have uh, uh, a large waiting list um, because more course, more students want to take it than um, uh, are, are allowed to take it. So I think it really has been very um, uh, gratifying um, to see that students are really um, uh, responding to this. They're not just simply trying to only take the courses that are going to uh, uh, make them more uh, economically viable, but rather they do want courses that will allow them to really um, think about the big questions um, uh, that maybe uh, when they were um, first on their way to uh, college, they, they thought they were going to um, uh, be able to talk about. Um, so uh, I, think, I think it has a real future, and I think this is what every um, uh, serious university um, uh, in the world should be um, engaged with, at least university universities that are um, uh, uh, located in countries where um, uh, democratic citizenship is something that um, sustains um, a way of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you for having the time to talk with us about your book, but also just for pursuing like your research agenda that connects us to our past and make us think about who we are as individuals, as society, for pushing initiatives such as the Sanford Civics Initiative. Thank you for all that. Um, I'll see you soon next, like, in our yep. office. Well, thank you very much, Javier. It's wonderful to have a chance to have this conversation. It's uh, uh, having uh, colleagues like you um, that makes this just such a great job. Thank you very much. See ya.